rehabilitation transition team and my role is to uh, be the liaison between school districts and vocational rehabilitation. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I do come from the ESC world. I have over 23 years of ESC experience. Um, I did work with students from elementary all the way up to post-secondary, but the majority of my experience was in transition. Um, and one of the things that I learned early on was that I had, my specialty was academics, but it was not in transition, especially with thinking about employment. So I got to know my VR counselor very well, um, and it became clear that we had a wonderful working relationship, that partnership, that helped those students, my students, transition very successfully into adulthood um, because of that partnership. But it became clear that not all my colleagues had that same philosophy. I shouldn't say philosophy, but they didn't have the same understanding. They didn't really understand what VR was, what we did, um, who they served, when did they start serving youth. So we kind of made, became my mission, you know, this is when I was working in New Hampshire, um, to become that person that helped to provide that information and build those relationships. About two and a half years ago, I became a consultant for the Department of Ed up there, um, and then Vocational Rehabilitation asked me to join their team part-time to help with those relationships. And then we had a horrific winter two winters ago, and I said to my husband, I am all done with this northern weather. I'm coming south. Hopefully you come with me. If not, I'm going anyway. But we're all here, so that's it. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about transition. There's been so many changes that have happened uh, with transition, especially with our new, new law, WIOA. But before we do that, I kind of would like to get a sense of who you are, if you don't mind. I know some of you are parents. Um, can we just go around the room quickly and just share your role and why, why you're here? Parents, 17 and a half year old daughter. And Great. I moved to Florida a little less than two years ago, so I feel very behind. Where did you move from? Tennessee. Oh, great. Well, welcome to Florida. Thank you. Um, my son uh, is 16. Uh, he has autism, and uh, he goes to a charter school in Tampa. And I wanted to get him to start thinking about working. Definitely, definitely. I have a 21-year-old son with autism who does have some behavioral challenges as well. He will be transitioning out of the school system this summer. And in terms of the school helping to coordinate any of this, they have sorely failed my son. So I'm trying to gain as much information as I can to put the pieces together. Thank you for your honesty and for being here, both of you. We're a um, parent of an 18-year-old who's just entering into the I'm Linda Spadella and I am the support coordinator who has acquired that, has graduated high school, is going to go into University of North Florida, but in the interim, he did go to VR because he, he wants a, uh, a job, a part time job. Mm -hmm. and so, um, the only thing is, they are getting back with us like they should. It's just, so difficult to get anything done and then you, you almost have to go there. You can't just call because they ignore your phone calls and ignore your, your messages. So, you know, I just need some, some information uh, assistance. Well, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for being here. I have a phone call there. Um, I have a young lady who is going to go to college who actually has, has done maybe 16 hours. And her VR counselor told her she was not, to her face, told her she was not causing children to know why she was there. And I just couldn't believe it was said. So I need information that I can share with her before I go to the supervisor. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, well, thank you for being here and sharing your story. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Julie. I have three children under a rehab in different stages of the process. Mm -hmm. I still don't get it. <laughs> um, and I work for a school district here in Florida. So, I mean, I know the ESC world and feel like I have all the answers to that, but nothing when it comes to transition. So. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jan Pierce. I also work for VR at headquarters, and I work primarily with supported employment and discovery and some of our other newer services and serve on the transition team as well. I'm Julie Cates. I'm the bureau chief at Vocational Rehabilitation on the program in Colorado. I'm also the parent of a 17 year old with a psychiatric disability who trying to figure out what's going to help her next too. Mm -hmm. 
We're just going around doing introductions. Would you like to introduce yourself? I am Yvonne Sawyer from Miami, and we run programs for high school kids with disabilities. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. So again, in thinking about um, vocational rehabilitation, just as that introduction to it, we are an agency that is all about helping I'm going to be speaking mainly about youth, but helping youth with um, disabilities to gain, maintain employment with the whole hope that they will become independent and because that is our hope, that is our goal. We want students to be able to, and again, I keep focusing on students because that's my area, but to have those skills that will allow them to be successful in life after high school. And in our particular program, it's all about um, employment. We do have youth programs as well as adult programs and when I talk about youth programs ending, it's not like they, they end and then that's the, that's the end of it all. Most of the time students, if they are in youth programs and they want to continue with vocation rehabilitation, they will transition into our <coughs> adult programs, just so you're aware. So who are the youth that we work with? We have all of our youth that we work with kind of tend to fall on three different tracks. So we have those students who want to go directly onto employment after they exit high school, so whether it be they graduate or they turn 22, or they want to go on to either a um, post-secondary institution, so two-year, four-year, or you know, beyond degree, or they want some kind of a certification. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is help students understand what the difference is and whatever job they want, what requirements that they may need, because sometimes students will spend a whole lot of time and money on a job to get a degree that they don't necessarily need. Um, my daughter just graduated from college. She's got $100,000 in student loans that she really didn't need to do. Um, of course, I didn't know anything. I was just her mother. Um, but then there's a lot of kids who go and, um, I, I take it you all know where I'm coming from this. Um, a lot of times you have students who might require a certification for their job. You think about IT or maybe even nursing assistants or whatever, and they make more than most of us do sitting in this room. So it all kind of depends upon what their job is, what is it they want to do, and then helping them to make the, discern the decision or the determination as what best um, education to, to pursue. In looking at the youth that we that qualify for a vocation rehabilitation, I would like to say that in the past we worked with youth that were 18 or 21 just about to transition out. That's, that was pretty much what we did for a very, very, very long time. Last year, we kind of started thinking as an agency, we need to start working <coughs> with these youth younger because if they're going to come up with an employment goal that makes sense, they've had some time to think through, Doing it in 18 and 21 just is not enough, doesn't give them the time to do that. So last year it was the 17 year olds and it might have been the 20 year olds. This year, uh, because of WIOA, we have started to work with youth at the age of 15. So we all knew that this was something that was needed, but WIOA gave us the authority to start doing with that because a lot of times schools were like, you know, we're working on academics, that's our focus. We don't want to pull kids out of school. They need to work on their courses and graduation requirements. Yes, we understand that, but coming from that education field, personally, I think transitions should start in elementary school. But that's just me with my, you know, my education hat. Because there's a lot of things that we can do in helping them to just start to think. Think beyond the box, think outside of the box. Think, think beyond what maybe you guys done, what grandma and grandpa did, what aunts and uncles have done and help them to start thinking about potential and opportunities and what they like and what they're good at, those kinds of things. So now with WIOA, we can do that. We can start working with youth at age 15. Now that doesn't mean we can't start talking with them about employment earlier. So especially that 14 to 15, that eighth to ninth grade year, we want to start supplying youth and families with information about vocational rehabilitation, but work with them at age 15. The individuals that we work with do have to have a documented disability, which means an IEP or 504, or they can have some other documented disability. So if there is a, um, a psychiatrist involved to diagnose mental health, we can work with them. If it's a medical doctor who might be diagnosing, uh, say, diabetes, or it might be ADHD, we can work with those youth as well. But if there is a student who somebody believes that that child has a disability, but yet does not have a determination, if you send them to us, we can do that um, evaluation. So it could be a psychological, well most of the time it is a psychological, but then there could be a number of other assessments that are done as well. 
So I don't want you to think just because they don't have a documented disability that they can't come to the ARC. They can't, and we would just do the, go through the eligibility process with them. We're also very, very interested in working with youth who are on, who do have a disability but are right on the edge of dropping out. You know, I've seen a lot in my work that 16, 17 year old that might be a middle schooler who you know once they turn 18, they're out of there. And we're lucky that they haven't been out of there already. And many, many times, those kids have seen failure so many times, over and over again. You know, they're, they feel that they're no good, they've been told that they're useless, that they can't do anything, they're not trying, I mean, God, and not that the teachers or the VR counselors are saying that, but you know, they hear those kinds of things. We're, what we believe is that if we can help them experience success, if we can help them engage in something that makes them feel good about themselves, if we can get them to see their value in society, in the larger picture as well as the smaller picture, then maybe they won't take that first drug. Maybe they won't take that first drink. Maybe they won't join a gang. Maybe they won't drop out of school. And we have that opportunity to do that because we can now start working with youth at 15. Real exciting kinds of things. The other I find with those at-risk kids is they do not see the relevance of school. Why do I need reading, writing, math? <laughs> I don't need that crap. Well, you know, what do you do? You want to be a mechanic. And what I have found is, although I can speak to them on their level and really have those heart-to-hearts, again, they don't listen to us, but I can put my students out with a mentor, someone within the community who does do that job, who is that expert, who is someone they may even know, and that person say to them, listen, if you want to be able to diagnose that car, you've got to be able to read that manual, understand that manual. Even if you can't physically read it, you've got to be able to have the skills to understand what's in there to diagnose the car. And then to write that invoice. If you don't have the skills to write an invoice, then that person who's coming to me is not going to want to pay me because they're not going to know the services that they've received. And then if you don't add that invoice up correctly, either I'm losing money because you didn't add it up right, or maybe the customer's not going to come back because you charged them too much. So sometimes it's having those people to give them the hook, the hook that will have them see the relevance of education and stay in school. When it comes to referrals, our referral, referrals typically come from schools, but they can come from outside providers as well as families. But the key thing here to remember is when we're working with youth under the age of 18, we have to have parental permission. Once the student has turned age of majority, they can sign for themselves. If it's a student who has, um, you know, we want to make sure they truly understand what's involved in work and what's involved in the process, we'll see if parents can definitely be involved in that as well. Um, but just know that under 18, we do have to have parental permission uh, for services. We are not an entitlement program, which means when you seek services at the school level, um, you get the services and the students, you know, basically all of their plan is done for them, and whether they want to be involved in ESC or not. With vocation rehabilitation, we ha they have to apply. So there is some kind of commitment on their part. When we're looking at disabilities, we look at all individuals with disabilities. So they have the cognitive disabilities, the developmental, intellectual disabilities, but they also have the physical and mental disabilities. One of the things that I've, actually I forgot to mention if you haven't heard already, I've spent since last November going and talking with every single school district in the state. And what I have found is that when it comes to those physical and those mental disabilities, maybe those kids who would typically fall under the 504, people are like, what? What do you mean? We didn't know that you worked with you know, those kids. I said, yes, we do. Because it could very well be a youth whose disability would impact them or could impact them when it comes to employment. You think about those kids who have anxiety, who have depression. Those kids who aren't coming to school because of those two conditions. If they're not going to school because of those conditions, do you think that's gonna affect them when it comes to the world of work? Of course it is, right? If they've got anxiety of working with people. When you think about those people who have those specific learning disabilities and they're having difficulty reading, and say their only course of getting to work is gonna be the bus. If they can't read that bus schedule, is that gonna impact their ability to work? Well, yeah, if they can't read it, then they're gonna have difficulties. So it really is looking at the whole picture and those students with disabilities and how it is that it impacts them when it comes to employment. Those are just some different things to think about 
you know, when you're like, well, could it potentially, could this impact? These are just some things that we'd like to focus on. Communication is a big thing. If students are not able to communicate their needs, their concerns, what it is that they have to do, whether it be receptive or them actually communicating that verbally, that's gonna cause them issues. Maybe it's self-care or self-help. If those are things that they're suffering with or that they're having to deal with, could impact them um, as well. Thinking about work tolerance or work endurance, sometimes these kids don't have the endurance to work for eight hours. So maybe it's starting to help them, maybe it's 30 minutes that works up to an hour, that works up to two hours, and so on and so forth. And they may never work eight hours a day, but at least we're helping them to kind of gain that um, stability, if you will, so that they can work, or maybe before they weren't able to do that. In thinking about eligibility again, one of the things I want to focus on is, I mentioned it just briefly, the last slide, is the want, students wanting services. In addition to students wanting services, they have to need our services and benefit from our services. But the key thing I like to focus on here is that want. Because sometimes kids, sometimes families, don't necessarily want a service. And when I talk to, to people about it, it's because they don't understand. They don't know who you are. They don't know what you do. Maybe they've never heard of us before. Sometimes it's actually, actually a cultural kind of thing. Maybe it's a counselor who's never been to that area before, and they're like, oh, we don't know you. You, know, you don't belong to our group. So this is where the schools become our biggest advocates. So we build relationships with the schools. They get to know us, they get to know our services, they get to see us actually working with youth so that if there is that situation, then they can go to those parents, they can go to those students and say, listen, I've seen them work with people, I know what they do, I see how it benefits. So that becomes really important for us. Students who have SSI or SSDI for their own disability are presumed eligible, just so you're aware of that. Um, that's something that we really try to help people understand. And sometimes parents think because they have a disability and are receiving SSI or SSDI that they would be eligible, but it's for the student's own disability. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to, to interrupt. One of the things um, that we have to do in vocation rehabilitation due to um, you know, funds being limited or just the way our process is, is we're on what's called an order of selection. And what that means is we have to prioritize the individuals that we work with based on the disability. So you might hear, well, this student qualified, this student didn't, didn't qualify, and we have kind of criteria that's based on that. So there are three levels or three um, priority, priority categories. That first one is for that, those individuals who have the most significant disabilities. Their disability impacts them in a variety of different ways not only just employment, but in employment, it could be the communication, it could be the self-help skills, it could be a number of those different things that I outlined. These individuals typically require a minimum of three of our services, and they require these services for a minimum of a year. So when you're talking about a youth, a student, who might be that 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 20, you know, kind of go up there, you're looking at services for a long period of time. That could very well be that category one youth. Category two would be the same type of profile student, only they wouldn't need those services for quite as long. So it would be like six months to a year. And then our category three are for those individuals that do have a disability that might impact them as far as employment, but it's not significant. They might need one service, they might need it for you know, a short period of time, but it's not significant. Um, in the past, we have had wait lists for all three, but right now we only have a wait list for category three. Um, all the other youth that you, or individuals we've worked with have been released from category one into category two. But most students that we do work with fall within that category one or category two. I think we have less than 1% who's in category three. So again, we're usually working with the majority of the youth that we have. There is a process that we have to follow when it comes to eligibility. So a student and parent would um, do a referral. There would be a referral that's made and then the application would be completed. And as I mentioned, um, it needs to be signed because parents have to be involved in that. Our eligibility process takes up to 60 days. Now, what's involved in eligibility? That's typically looking at a psychological, whether if one has been done from the school, they're usually so, so old. I mean, I think I've seen them like from second grade and third grade. So we would have to do another psychological. Now, when I say we, the, guy, the counselors aren't the ones who do it. We would actually contract with someone to do the psychologicals. Um, the psychologicals are, are done, a uh, report is written, there's usually some vocational assessments that are done as well to see what skills does the student have, what interests do the student have, to really help get a picture of that youth. Um, 
Then there is the, once they're found eligible, then that's where the plan gets developed. And that plan is called an Individualized Plan for Employment, opposite to an IEP, which is an Individualized Education <laughs> Plan. Um, that's been hard for me to transition between the two. But that plan development is when all of that information will be looked at, that assessment information will be looked at, that labor market analysis will be done, those conversations about what the student really wants to do. They'll look at developing an employment goal for that youth that is based on what the student wants to do and what the student needs. And then from that, services are delivered, the placement is made as far as who that is that the student's gonna work with, and then closure, it means successful closure. The student has a job, they've had that job for 90 days, or if it's supported employment, it could be up to 150 days, and then the case is closed. In thinking about youth, we're really trying to push counselors to, if not exactly get to those 60 and 90, make them less than that, because we wanna get youth through as, as quickly as we can, because we wanna get them to those services. Okay, what is VR's transition uh, framework for transition services? It's based on kind of a twofold. So what the students need and then what the employers want. And thinking what students need to do when it comes to employment, they need to find out what it is that they're good at. Not only what, what they like to do, but what is it that they can do. A lot of times kids will think about their interests, but they don't necessarily translate that to a job. But a lot of the things that the kids are interested in can be translated to, to a job, and that's something that we would help them do. But it's helping them to identify their interests, their abilities, their aptitudes, their skills, and then what does that mean for work. It's also helping students to develop a concept of work and what it means to them. There's a study that if students work in high school, they're gonna be much more successful after school. They've got those work ethics, they have that value, they have that appreciation. They have that excitement as far as, I'm gonna be getting a paycheck, how exciting is this? And I can buy things that I wanna buy, or maybe help to the family, contribute to family. Um, as I mentioned, working in high school kind of gives them that work ethic. And a lot of times when others in school are seeing kids work, they're like, hey, I, you know, how are you doing this? How are you buying these new shoes? And man, I'm working, and it you know, gets to be kind of a status. Um, it also helps youth navigate the community and gets to know their supports and what's out there. It helps them build relationships. Um, and it's not only helping them build relationships with community, but it's helping the community to understand them. Students are the future, right? Students are those future adults that, that, that are gonna be within a community. And a lot of times, we don't give them the opportunity to experience them. We're gonna get talking about people having a vested interest in transition, and to me, that's everybody. It's the school community, and it's also the external community. But they're not, the external community is not gonna see their value if we don't give them the opportunity to actually engage with these youth early. And then, that early involvement in vocation rehabilitation helps us to build relationships with the youth, as well as build relationships with families, Quite often, if you have youth already, you've heard of this whole concept of tr uh, seamless transition. Seamless transition is very important because we want students to know that you know, once they leave high school, there's a clear pathway for them. They've already built those resources and supports. They already know who's gonna be there with them um, when they graduate. But it's also the same for parents too. Because I know this stuff can be scary for you guys. So kind of helping with this whole transition process as well um, kind of makes it a little bit easier. But that early involvement helps with all those kinds of things. Now, what do employers want? Well, I know with my boss, they wanted experience. Well, a lot of youth coming from school don't have that experience. We can provide them that experience, give them those on-the-job trainings, give them them work opportunities that they can put on resumes. Those soft skills, those social skills, those employability skills, those things that no matter what career you go into or what job you go into, you're gonna have the skills to be successful those interpersonal skills, those problem solving skills, those abilities to kind of look at conflict and then so and appropriately be able to react to that. Employers want someone that they know, and this is where those mentors come into play, or those internships and they build relationships with you. A lot of times when kids do internships, what happens? They get employed by those people. And if not employed by that company, that boss knows that boss, so they have that you know connection, if you will. References definitely come from um, the individuals that youth work with, but you know when you fill out an application, what do you need, right? You need to have references so they can get that. 
And then when it comes to formal education, we, get, we have to be careful with that because formal education doesn't necessarily mean a degree. It means a degree or it means a certification, something that gives them an edge over somebody else who's just graduated from high school. And I don't want to say just because that, that is a feat in itself, but it might be something that if you've got someone who has their degree or has a certification and has just their diploma, then who are they going to go with? This is the person who has the advanced education. So in thinking about what formal education can look like, again, that can be that certification from a career and technical education program, or it can be a college and university with one of the degree programs. One of the stories I like to share with people is, um, there was a young man that I worked with who wanted to be a veterinarian. And I had, he had disabilities, but I had absolutely no hesitation or doubt that he would be successful. So um, I put him in a job shadow where he was there for a week, and he came back to me and said, Mrs. Ward, he said, I can't do this job. And of course, he was hysterical, very upset. And I said, well, why? What's the matter? What's going on? He said, I had to kill an animal today. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? Euthanasia, right? They have animals. They have to put animals down. And although he didn't do it, he was a part of it because he observed it. But if he became a vet, what would he do? He would have to do that. That would be part of his job responsibilities. So we talked about, okay, well, that's not going to work with you. Vet tech, also a responsibility that they have, that was not going to work for him. Well, what are some others? After a long process, he ended up deciding to do pet grooming, dog grooming, because why? He loved working with animals and making them feel good, and that's exactly what he did. So he ended up you know, doing that, and that's what he still does. But think about if he, I, if he hadn't had that experience, and I wasn't able to do that for him. He would have gone to veterinarian school, spent a whole lot of time and money on something that he probably wouldn't have been able to do. So again, it's helping them to kind of make those decisions, but also knowing what it is you need in order to be whatever it is that you want to do. The components of VR, uh, it's basically trifold. It's thinking about three different pieces, that networking opportunity, having students to get to know people, work with others, building relationships, um, hands-on work, so being put into a real-life setting where they get to do real-life things. Because in schools, it's very controlled, right? You know, you know who you're working with. People are very protective as far as what happens and how things happen. When you put them out into the real world, it gives them a whole other opportunity to explore. So those are things that we work with. And then as far as social skills, helping them to develop those skills, gain confidence in their skills, become very secure with those skills, so that whenever they go to new situations, they'll be able to handle those. And I'm not saying without support, because clearly some kids are going to need that support, but at least they'll be a whole lot better off than just going right from a school to a place that they're unknown. Now we come to WIOA. Um, and this new law, which got started, it's not really new, it was put into place in July of 2014. Many pieces to this particular law, but what we're going to focus on are these three main lectures this for, but three on the screen. And one of the biggest purposes is this early preparation to employment. It's thinking about helping students identify strengths, identify needs, identify what they like, identify what they don't like. Um, it's helping them to gain skills, gain aptitudes, gain abilities. And it's also kind of a, what I use is, it's called gap analysis where if a student wants to do something, and this is what they have to do, it's helping them to determine what they're gonna need to kind of close that gap so that they can do the job that they do. But in order to do that, they have to have that early preparation. When we started working, or when we were working with youth at 18 and 21, do you think they really had any realistic idea of what they wanted to do? What, you know, a goal that was attainable, measurable, reachable? Mm, a lot of times not. But starting to work with them early, it gives them an opportunity to kind of navigate a path. I want to try this, I want to try that, I want to work with animals. Okay, great, we'll go ahead and work with animals. Man, I don't like cleaning poop. <coughs> well, if you want to you know, work with animals, you have to clean poop. So it's thinking, and I use animals a lot because kids tend to love working <laughs> with animals. Um, so it's helping them to see what they like, what they don't like, what they're good at, what maybe things that they need some assistance with, and maybe it's identifying accommodations. Maybe they never really thought about, well, I want to do a certain job, but in order to do that job, I have to have certain things that will allow me to do that job. Collaboration. This is why I've been doing a lot of work with the schools. Collaboration when it comes to transition. It used to be school districts and VR. Now the law is telling us we have to work together. It's no longer whether you want to. And I know that's been an issue in the past because I've heard schools say, 
we don't need you. We don't, you know, we can handle this. But now with the new graduation requirements, where so much focus is on, on academics, they can't do a lot of this employment uh, preparation work. This is where we can pick up the slack and where we are going to be picking up the slack. What schools can't do when it comes to employment, we can do. After school, evenings, weekends, summers, vacations. Because almost all of our services, except for one program, are there to support and enhance what happens in school. We use the term supplementing as opposed to supplanting. Supplanting is what happens in the school. Supplementing is what happens outside of school to help give them that, you know, that kind of boost, if you will. Um, kids over the summertime tend to lose a lot. We can work with them over the summer so that they're not losing. What they're doing is actually gaining, continuing, continuing to gain skills, especially employment skills or employability skills. But collaboration is also thinking about, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago, who are those other stakeholders? Um, when you have, con or not you, when conversations happen about that future citizen, you know, all of these students are going to be, be future citizens, and the librarian, and the police chief, and the the, the community um, decision makers, what are they called? Council. Yeah, okay, thank you, the community councils. Um, all of those people have a vested interest in those youth, right? Because again, they're gonna have to work with them. Future businesses, um, when you think about mental health agencies, these are all individuals who these youth may have to work with in the future. Why I mention that is because if we start having conversations with these individuals now, while these youth are still in school, we can help them to see what are the needs? What are some of the things that the kids are struggling with? What are the, some of the things that you can do to help these kids? Maybe be that mentor. Maybe be that person who can have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with that youth. Maybe help that student share your passion with them so they can gain that passion. It's also thinking about what are some of the things that I do that you can benefit from? Or what are some of the things that we can do together in order to? And these are conversations that we're having around the state. That first conversation that I had with the, with the uh, school district agency, we had these conversations. We started talking about who it is we needed to bring to this transition table. The next step, um, most school districts have what's called interagency councils or interagency committees. And these committees bring a lot of different transition stakeholders together. So I'm gonna look at being part of those. VR usually is part of those um, meetings anyway, but I, I would like to be a part of them as well as far as helping with this transition conversation. Increased access to VR services or increased availability. Um, just like that young man I was talking about before, um, if we're able to work with these kids earlier and give them opportunities to explore and experience, sometimes it helps them to see not only what they're gonna be good at, but if they have limitations or barriers that maybe they didn't think about would impact them as far as a particular job. So an example I have is I had a young man who wanted um, to be a sports announcer, but he had a very bad speech impediment. And me as an educator, it was not my job to tell that student that he couldn't do that. And nor is it a VR counselor's job to tell them that either. But what it is our job is to help them come to that decision or determination themselves. So this young man, his name was Justin, um, as I said, wanted to be a sports announcer. So part of the process that I worked out with, with my VR counselor was we did a lot of uh, research first, and then the student had to develop what was called informational interview questions. So it was things that they wanted to know about not only the career itself, but maybe how did it impact that person? Um, maybe not only what education, but what did that what did that mean to you as far as financial consequences? What loans did you have, so on and so forth. So they developed these informational interview questions, and then they actually asked these questions to a professional, to an expert. Once they get through that process, then I set them up with a job shadow, where they had to go in and observe. Now Justin, after he left that informational interview with the sports announcer, was a little concerned because the sports announcer talked to him about expectations, and speed and accuracy and all those kinds of things. But he was still going to do it. So we then had him do the job shadow. Now, for the job shadow, I had mom come along because I thought it was going to be really important for mom to see just what was involved in this job. So sure enough, we brought him to, we had like a feeder team for baseball, it's called the Fisher Cats, um, up in New Hampshire. And there was a press box, which he thought was pretty cool that he could get into the press box. 
And he actually observed this process. Now, I don't know if any of you know about what goes on. I had no idea, because I'm not a sports person. But you want to talk about some crazy stuff. That speed, that accuracy, just all of the activity that goes in there, and the yelling, and the screaming, and all this kind of stuff. Justin and Mom left saying, there's no way that he can do this job. So what we did, again, as his team, is we said, well, what about the sports announcing was that you really wanted to do? And after some many you know, conversations, it was really the stats. That's what Justin was interested in, was following that player, keeping track of the numbers. That's what he got the most out of. It wasn't necessarily the speaking piece of it. So we then talked to the sports announcer, and we said, this is what Justin loves. This is what he wants to do. Is there anything we can work out with him so that he can do this as a job? And the sports announcer said, well, sure. If Justin can follow the players and he can identify them and the scores and then give me the information and I can go ahead and broadcast it, that would be a great marriage. That would be a great opportunity. And that's what he did. And that's what he still does. That, and I didn't know this at the time, was called customized employment. Sometimes we use job carving. But who knew? I didn't know that's what it was called, but that's what it's called. It was finding a job that was needed that a student was able to do because of his ability and because of his interest. And wow. just so loved it. It was the greatest thing. But that happened because of that increased access. If we hadn't started that early, again, it would have just said, sorry, Justin, you know, that's not something that we can get you to do. But so we're able to work about that, work around that. Services with VR and youth programs need to start before they exit school. So in thinking about the plan, thinking about those services starting, they do need to start prior to the student exiting. But again, once they exit, we do have the adult services that we can offer. And really, the only difference between student, the youth program, and the adult is just where the money comes from, just, just so you know. OK, now this is my favorite piece. Um, the other and most significant piece I think about WIOA is the whole thought process that we need to be able to provide services to any youth with disabilities. A lot of times, as I mentioned, VR is seen with those ESC kids. We're having the conversations about those 504 kids, but it's any student with disability because a student might have a unique ability that impacts them on a large scale, or maybe it's just a small scale. When you think about maybe those at-risk kids, it could just be that they need that one thing to make them feel good or feel success. So vocational rehabilitation is going to be able to start offering services in two pathways. We're going to have that traditional pathway where students go through the full eligibility process where they apply and they have to you know, show determination of eligibility and they get accepted, so on and so forth. And in that particular case, there's a number of services that would be available to that youth. I mean, it's pretty much endless. Um, our director was talking earlier, it's whatever the student needs, our services that we'd be able to work with them on providing. But then we're also going to be able to provide services to students who do not have to go through eligibility. These are kids who might be that category three who wouldn't have qualified, or it might be that student who just needs something small in order to give them that boost to be successful. Maybe it's a kid who's not really sure about working. We can give them opportunities to try working and see how they feel about it. What do they like? What, you know, what kind of, um, what does it make? Or how does it make them feel? And sometimes that's enough, again, to hook them into that whole concept of school and work. These services for youth who do not require eligibility, they do still have to have a disability. And they have to have it, either a 504, an IEP, or again, have some disability documented by somebody else, whether it be a physician or a psychiatrist. Um, the youth who have disabilities who are at risk of dropping out, again, youth that we would be able to work with. When it comes to those referrals for these um, services not requiring eligibility, we're asking that those come through the school. Because to me, if you as a parent, if an outside provider has that much of a concern for a student, the school should know about it. And sometimes they're not always up on what's going on with kids, so we want to make sure that they do that. Um, when it comes to these services that are not requiring eligibility, our computer process is, or our computer system, our IT group is in the process of developing a system that will be able to handle these. So we have to be able to track these services, pay our vendors. We're anticipating the rollout for this will be in August. And we don't know that for sure, only because it depends upon IT. But do know that that's coming. Right now, the students who want to go through that full eligibility process, we're on board. Let's do that right now, here and then. 
but as far as those services not requiring eligibility, just kind of keep an eye out. Schools have all been made aware of this, and they will know, or they know, that once these are available, they'll be ready. So we're hoping by the beginning of the school year, fingers crossed. But you know how it is with technology. Um, with WIOA, the services that we're going to be able to offer you are called pre-employment transition services. I like to think of them these in like two different kind of pathways. I go into pathways again. There's career exploration and then there's career preparation. When we talk about pre-employment transition services, these are career exploration. Students are exploring themselves, they're exploring careers, they're, ex they're exploring what's out there and what's available to them. It's that preparation piece that would be that more um, career specific as opposed to those transferable skills. These pre-employment transition services, because we're talking about youth who are still in school, are available until students graduate or they exit. If students decide to go through those um, services that do not require eligibility, students can at any time decide they want to go ahead and apply for services. So they're not stuck in a track of if they don't want to apply, they can't. They can apply at any time. And the opposite to that is true also. So if we have those students who might just need a little support, they might just need a resume, they might just need some interview skills, and once they have that, they feel pretty confident and comfortable, they can tell us, you know what, I think I'm all set. And if that time they feel they're good, everyone's in agreement, great, we can close our case, but they can come back at any time. They can either come back to do those pre-employment transition services, or they can come back and apply for services. Okay, in making decisions and knowing what's right for me. I know when I've worked with youth, when you start talking about what do you want to do, I haven't the slightest idea. What's right for you? What's right for me? I don't know. So it's helping kids to develop those questions, those set of questions that help them to kind of think about what is going to be best for them. And we do that by some of the services that we offer in these pre-employment transition services. So the first set of services that we're looking at are those vocational evaluations. In the ESC world, a lot of times they coin them as transition assessments, but sometimes they're much more than that. For us, it's looking at those interest inventories, those skills, abilities, aptitude assessments. It's helping them to kind of see where they fit within the world of work. Sometimes it's interviews, that we will do interviews with students and say, well, what is it that you like? You know, what are some of the things that you do at home? What are some of the things that you're interested in? What are some of the things that make you feel good about yourself? Because assessments might be very difficult for kids to do. And I had a question when I did a presentation yesterday that said, well, what if the student's nonverbal? Well, we do have situational assessments where we can put students in a variety of different settings and see how they perform. What are some of the things that they enjoy doing when they're actually doing, they've got smiles on their faces as opposed to, you know, you can tell when students don't like something, they're a little grumpy. Um, so we can do those kinds of things that help them with that. Discovery is something I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about coming up, but I will let you know that Discovery is an assessment tool, it's a, kind of a two-parter, but the first part is an assessment tool, which helps us to identify a strength, an aptitude, an ability, an interest of a student who typically is that student who maybe at one point in time would be considered that they can't work, just, just not sure if they would be able to work. Um, ESC assessments tend to be a bit negative, okay, a bit is not accurate, they tend to be negative and it's what the student can't do and how low they are. These discovery assessments are very positive. It's all um, strength oriented or interest oriented. And what they do in that process, and it's a very long process, 30 hours, um, and it includes them being observed as well as uh, interviewing students and families, and they do this in a variety of different settings, so school, home, community, and they get to see kids in action. Some of the things that a school district teacher may not know, some things that a VR counselor would not necessarily know by meeting with them once or twice, this helps them to really identify something that they're good at. And that would be part of that of vocational evaluation. The next service that we're able to do in this um, career exploration piece is taking all of that assessment data and helping students to process through that. What does it mean for them? So you have all these skills, abilities, whatever, that came up on this assessment. Now let's look at the jobs. Let's see what you have compared to what that job says you need to have. And then thinking about that kind of gap analysis that I talked about, helping bring that all together. 
It's looking at what education that you might need for that job. It's asking them questions. Listen, you want to be a ski instructor? We don't have any snow here. Are you willing to move? If you're willing to move, great, then we can continue and proceed with this. But if you're not, we're going to have to most likely look at something else. It's looking at labor market analysis. What jobs are out there? Where's that need? And then helping students to maybe see where they fit into that if that's something that they want to do. So all of these kinds of things VR counselors do as in their role in working with you. Again, those assessments would be done through a vendor, but guidance and counseling is something that we do with, with the youth or we do with our customers. The next piece of these um, pre-employment transition services is what's called work readiness trainings. These are pre-placement trainings. These are courses that we're able to offer you. They're 20 hour courses that provide all of those skill building kind of activities. So it's looking at those social skills, those interpersonal skills, it's resume writing, it's interview skills, it's um, conflict resolution, it's financial literacy. All of the things that students need to know in order to be prepared for work. Um, these courses are being offered by vendors. I've also talked with schools about becoming vendors for these as well because typically schools will know the students very well, will know the families and know the community, so they kind of know what it is that the students need. Um, these courses, we're looking at partnering with schools so that they can be offered at the school building after school where transportation home might be um, available. It's also looking at the library. It's looking at the Boys and Girls Club um, or any other kind of community-based place where students go that these courses can be offered. The follow-up to that is once the students have those skills, then they have the opportunity to apply those skills, to apply them and practice them. And they get to do that in the work experiences. Um, this is when the student actually gets to try out things that they find out things that they like, things that they don't like, things that they're good at, things that they may not be so good at. Um, how they feel about working with others, or maybe it's something they like to do alone. This is where they have that opportunity to explore. Oops. Um, also during this work experience, this is where you might hear OJT, on the job trainings, that's where we might would be working with these things. Also community-based work experiences. And again, these are opportunities for students to work not in the school where they have their people that they know, but actually be out in the community where they're being challenged to work with others that they don't, but yet still have, still have those resources and supports available to them. We're also working on self-advocacy and peer mentoring. Um, those are two programs that we feel are very important because in order for students to be successful, they've got to be able to stand up for themselves. They have to be able to you know, know what they need and then go ask for help. Um, who are their natural supports within the environments that they work in? So those are two programs that we're looking at. Peer mentoring is something where you have an older student that helps kind of that development process with a younger student. So although those aren't in full force, we are in the process of developing those. And the whole purpose, again, of these pre-employment transition services are to help students make informed decisions about the future. Um, vocational rehabilitation is all about informed choice, students understanding what options they have available to them, but in order to be able to choose a job, choose a career, and that's what we want, we want students to be successful but also be happy in their careers, they've got to know what works for them. And that's where the, all of these services kind of help them to get to that point. All right, so I've talked about those services for the youth who can either go through that eligibility process or can actually go through those uh, non-traditional process of those uh, in-school youth services. The services I'm gonna talk about now are for those youth who do have to qualify. So those other ones, there was they, they can or they don't have to, but these, they do have to qualify for services. Um, for those of you who might be aware of PBIS, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. I don't know if anyone has ever heard that. It's a the three-tiered approach in school. This would be like your tier two, so that additional intervention. So those students who do apply and are found eligible can still access those pre-employment transition services. But you might have students who need some assistance with that college decision. And who, where is it that they're gonna go? What programs do they offer? Maybe it's some assistance with the FAFSA. These are things we can help them with if they become uh, customers of VR. Job placement assistance, helping them to actually find jobs, things that we can do. 
that supported and customized employment. A lot of times students, especially with those more significant disabilities, need more help. They need more one-on-one. -on -one. They need more assistance. Those are things we can do with that um, supported and customized employment. And then when it comes to support services, these are things that the students might need in order to be successful in that work environment. So thinking about assistive technology. Now you know some of your students might have um, assistive technology in schools for their academics. We're talking about assistive technology for employment. So maybe they need van modifications in order to get to and from work, or maybe they need some assistive technology um, in college, or maybe door modifications, all those kinds of things that we could potentially help with. Transportation, these are things where students might need assistance getting to these work experiences. Um, if there's public assistance, uh, public assistance, public transportation available, we're gonna look at that as far as vouchers. <laughs> if there's family that can actually drive students to, um, these different opportunities, it can look at gas reimbursement. So there's a number of things that we try to do for that. And then if students need uniforms for work, they need special clothing or special shoes, we can assist with that. Or maybe even for interviews, if they need uh, clothing for interviews, we can help with that as well. The intensive services, these are the programs that VR supports that, again, are for those students who have the most significant need. Um, discovery, I mentioned the first part of that. Um, what I'd like to do with the second part is to kind of give you an example to work from. So I talked about that first part, which is all about um, finding or identifying those strengths. The second part is when that person who's gotten to know that student then goes out and finds something that matches or works for, for you. There was a young man who had, um, he was on the spectrum, and I believe he had a touch of OCD, although that was not identified. And in this scenario that I described, to you if I offend anyone I do apologize um, but this young man in going into the home they observed him there and as well as the school in the community and they noticed that whenever he did anything he was very meticulous in attention to detail so for instance when he put the dishes away because that was part of his job all of the dishes were lined up perfectly unlike most teenagers sorry they just throw things in the dishwasher at least mine do no very much attention to detail meticulous his closet his shirts were lined up from whites to darks and all of the colors organized in like kind of that whole spectrum type thing. His drawers were all, all of his underwear, t-shirts, socks were all folded perfectly, neat and aligned. So in seeing this, they had the conversation with the family and, and not with the youth, but they got to know the youth that he didn't like working with others. He very much needed to be by himself. So the discovery facilitator went out into the community and ended up going to Applebee's. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but they have the, the silverware and the napkin is folded perfectly over the, the silverware. So when this discovery facilitator was in there, he noticed that there's a greeter at the door. And then that greeter has to leave, this, um, leave the station to then go fold napkins if they run out. Which means there needs to be a waiter or waitress that has to then fill that job. So it's kind of a ripple effect. So the discovery facilitator said to the manager, I have a student who would be perfect at this, you know, loves doing this kind of work, would be very fast and speedy, and then your people wouldn't have to leave their post. Can he come in? So sure enough, they had him come in, did an internship, they hired him within a month. It was like the greatest thing because the kid was happy, was able to do what he loved to do, felt really good about themselves, and then all of the other employees got to do what they needed to do. So that is discovery. It's kind of that whole um, process. Third party cooperative arrangements are the one program that we are able to work with schools that are offered within the school day. This program is typically for the 18 to 21 year olds, um, although it doesn't have to be. Again, because school is so focused on academics, that employment piece is, you know, usually comes into play. So the TPCA is that program that um, schools will typically offer once the students have truly completed their academics. Maybe they're deferring graduation. What happens here is there is an employment specialist who takes these students, these six, it's a minimum of six students, out into the community to do community-based work experiences. And they are able to do that supported employment with them, bring them out there, help them learn the skills, whether it be specific skills or whether it be um, uh, just those employability skills, work with all those kinds of things with the intention of the student getting a job at the end. That's kind of the whole focus, is that students getting jobs at the end. That is something that is, again, an arrangement between the school and VR. 
Um, in my sessions that I've talked with everybody, um, I did explain that to them. In fact, we have about 10 new districts coming on board with TPCAs. So this is kind of going out more and more, just so you know that if it's not already in your district, it may be. And if it is in your district, you might want to talk with your, the, you know, your uh, transition person about your student being available for that or qualify for that. Project Search is another program that we support. And what that is, is again, it's a kind of a partnership between schools, VR, and um, a business, and it's usually a large business. And what happens is, is there's a teacher that comes from the school, will teach an employment class right in that business, and then the students get to do internship rotations, three. And typically it's a hospital, or it might be a hotel chain. Um, we have one in a zoo, so there's a number of different um, opportunities for youth. And they're not looking at career-specific skills, they're looking at transferable skills. And Florida has the highest 100% rate for Project Search. So again, this is something that schools offer in combination with VR support. So you might want to ask your school districts about that because they've heard about this as well. And then post-secondary education programs. Um, these are the programs where students can experience, explore the college life. So for instance, it's looking at um, what does what is college about? Sometimes students can go in there and do workforce certifications, like Jacksonville has a workforce certification program in their TIPSID program. Um, and there's like 14 of them around the state. I do actually have, I was supposed to go through each of these slides as I went through, and I, I'm sorry I didn't. Um, but the TIPSID program, which is the kind of that organization or consortium that is um, in charge of these, if you look at that website, it will give you all of the different um, all of the different locations. locations. Thank you, all the different locations. We are able to support tuition. If students want to do those workforce certifications, we're able to support those. Um, if they're taking classes then that go towards their employment goal, we're able to help with that as well. High School High Tech is yet another program that we have, and this program is not necessarily only for students with most significant disabilities, it's all disabilities. So it's any student who has that unique ability, and for any student who's interested in STEM. So in thinking about the science, technologies, um, engineering, and math, students who want those kinds of opportunities, we can help with that. And during these um, high school high tech experiences, there's the job shadows, there's internships, and all those kinds of things that students are able to experience and explore. Vocational rehabilitation, I think one of the last pieces I want to share with you is that we are personalized, we are individualized, which means something that you hear Johnny get, uh, Mary may not get, because what Johnny has and the disability Johnny has and the needs Johnny has may be very different than uh, what Mary has. So VR is personalized. We look at those assessments, the uh, results, we talk to the students, we talk to the families, we do those kinds of quality control kinds of things that help us to identify what it is that the student wants to do and what they need to do in order to reach their goals that they have. So we're all about that. Um, one of the people that we had yesterday asked, well, what happens if they're not getting what, you know, what the student might need? Well, that's where communication comes into play. And if you feel that, or we feel that the vendor is not necessarily giving the student what they need, we need to know that from the parent. If you feel that way, um, we do a lot of communications with our vendors. They have to provide uh, monthly reports. Customers also communicate with our parents. We'll communicate with VR counselors to talk about progress, how things are going. And if something that we're doing is not meeting that student's needs, then we might have to tweak it. And when it comes to those IPEs, it's okay. We can do amendments to show that we have to change what's going on. And that's perfectly fine because, again, we want to make it personalized. We want to make it individualized. And having conversations with youth is helping them to kind of think about what is it that they need to do in order to get to the next level, so those next steps. Asking them, do you want to be independent? Do you want to work? Do you want to be that productive member of society? Do you want to be a productive member of your community? What are some things that you can do in order to prepare for that? And if they don't know or they're not sure, well, that's where VR comes into play. If they answer yes, they do want to work. If they answer yes, they want to be independent. It's then letting them or letting them know that they have vocational rehabilitation that's available to, to them to help them prepare. 
if your youth are currently in high school, um, one of the things that we encourage is for students to be very active members of their transition IEP team meetings. In the planning, in that process, knowing what's involved, self-advocacy is something that if we can get that, get that concept into youth now, while they're young, then they'll be pretty much all set. I encouraged, when I was um, an ESC teacher, by the time my students were seniors, they were actually running their own IEP meetings. I think that's, that, you know, that's the way to go. But helping kids to be a part of that decision-making, part of their transition team is important. We have to be invited to those IEP meetings, so whether it be parents and youth, letting the school district staff know that they want us there to be a part of the meeting is gonna be important. Students need to make their interests known to VR. Parents need to make their interests known um, to the school districts that they want to be in part of VR so that that application can be made. And then, of course, meet with the VR staff in order to begin the process. If any, anyone here has those youth that are about ready to transition or they have already transitioned out of high school, you want to contact the nearest VR office next near you so that you can make that appointment with that VR counselor. Um, that website there, and there's PowerPoint presentations, but that website there, it leads you to a map, and on that map you can click on where it is, that, which county you live in, and it will bring it up, and there's a whole list of um, offices that you can find out which one is the closest to you. And then once you do that and you call them, then they'll make an appointment to, to schedule that. When it comes to those appointments, some of the things that you'll need to think about bringing with you is the IEP, the 504, any like past assessments that have done, whether it be a psychological or maybe those behavioral assessments, ABA, um, you're gonna wanna have those. Typically transcripts with things that would, you'd wanna bring with you, um, discipline records if there is one. All of those things help us to kinda get a good picture of that youth. Um, and then they'll also let you know if there's anything else. So if there are transition assessments that have been done, bringing those, but if not, if there's not enough or you don't have them, that's okay, they can look at, we can look at doing those ourselves. Okay, I've thrown a whole lot at you, so yes. <laughs> How am I doing for time? Oh, of course I'm over by three minutes, sorry. So, so as Mike's an example, he's 16. So we haven't, I know we haven't had any kind of what we are meeting at this school. So next year, would I tell the school like, hey, I want an IEP and can you bring the VR person? Or can I go straight to VR? Or well, since we're, we're in the summer now, right. I would go right through VR. Oh, if, like, okay. Yeah, I would, because I don't know what school personnel is there. If right. it was during the school year, I would suggest to you to go to the school because I would want them to know that this is something that you want your child to do. Okay. But since we're summer, I would go ahead and make the referral. Yeah. I mean, do the application. Is that by county or? Yes. Um, if I could get onto the internet, I could, do you have a map? We have a copy of that. Oh, let me just grab, can I borrow this for a second? Yes. Thank you. So when you pull up this web, oh, well that website I had up there, it brings you, minus this, it brings you to this map here, and you find the county that you live in, and you just click on it, and it will bring you to all of the offices that are in that county. Okay. So you'll find the one that's closest to you, right. and then that would be, they'll already have the connection to the school, um, but yeah, that way you can connect with them so, directly. But he could get started on the process before the school year, or? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. You can get started right now. Oh, well, tomorrow, because today you're here. <laughs> <laughs> not Monday. Sunday you were here. Monday, Monday. Probably not Sunday. No, yeah. Monday. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All my children have had a really high turnover of counselors for VR. Is there anything you guys are doing to help stop that? I mean, especially with my guys on the spectrum and try to get comfortable with someone. Yeah, well, unfortunately, just like with school districts, we can't kind of control the turnover. But what we are doing, um, I will share, is that whole... Since we need to start looking at transition differently and now with WIOA and having more people coming on board, we're looking at having all of our counselors trained so that they can work with youth as well as adults. Um, we're working with Project 10, which is an organization that does the training with um, the ESC staff around the state to train our staff as well. Is so that Project New? Project, project 10? 10? Yeah. No, it's okay. a discretionary project that's, I don't know, 10? 12 years, it's been around, but they provide training to the ESC staff. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted was that our transition training that our staff was getting was the same as what is happening in the schools for that kind of, you know, consistency kind of purposes. So they what we're hoping, oh, go ahead. Yeah, they, have a table. they do, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. In fact, they're right across from us. 
um, what we're hoping is that once our staff has more training and they have those relationships built with the school, then maybe we'll kind of cut down on that. But I know it's an issue, but it's an issue for schools too. Um, and I don't, other than paying them more to keep them here. Um, <laughs> not in our people. Yeah, unfortunately. But we're I, doing I, everything we can that is in our people. Yeah. Like that's um, we're hoping though that our staff is being encouraged to get out into the schools to build those relationships with them to build the relationships with the families and we're hoping that if they have those established relationships then maybe they won't be quite as likely to for that turnover but it, unfortunately we don't have it. that's a good question though. it's just a problem I mean literally within a year and a half my child has had five or six counselors and, and the turnover made the process longer we are working on that. And we, do and we just got a letter before I came to the cafe again. So I was like, about another yes. transfer or another another change? person. Yeah. It's just hard. It's hard for him. It's hard for me. It's just like another one. I just got used to the name. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll work on it. We'll continue I'll work on working it as long as the kids get jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So if I call, let's say one day, like how long does it usually take to get started? Well, Except you should like get a sixty or ninety. Yeah, well, that's that's throughout the whole process, but yeah. you should get a call back pretty immediate within the, a few days. Okay. Um, and then what they would do is ask you what kind of documentation that you have. Um, if you have any of the copies of all of that psychological IEP 504, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, um, let them know that you have that, and that might be enough just to get it started. They do have relationships with the school, so if it's something that they need that you say, well, I know the school has it, then they can call them, but if they're on vacation, I don't know well, what you call them. Do you have any of the assessment results? If not, it's not a big deal. I have, yeah, I need to do that. Okay, yeah. Just plan on bringing that. So it should be within a pretty quick turnaround to be able to get in there and do that. Yes, we have a slightly different problem because I work with teachers in the system. We have access to all the IPs. What we're trying to do is advocate to get the parents to give the permission to get this process started. And we can advocate all we want, but I mean, that has been our barrier because of language or cultural issues in Miami. They don't want to do it. Yeah. And then the kids graduate and sit at home watching TV. Right. That, that is definitely an issue. Um, it's not as much of an issue, but, you know, trying to get parents to sign or get to the meetings mm -hmm. can be. Um, we are in the process of working on developing a streamlined VR referral process and a tracking method um, so that if VR counselors are trying to get parents to meetings, get parents to sign things, get documentation and they can't, that there's a communication pathway back to the school so that the school can help with that as well. Um, because we know it's kind of a give and take and I know there's been times where we've tried to get in touch with families and then we come to find out the students and the families moved and it's like, well, it would have been nice to know. Um, but it's kind of accountability on both pieces and both parts, but we are trying to work on that by, again, working on that and developing that relationship with the school. But I, I do hear that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we're way beyond our end time. Um, I'm here if you have any questions that you need any more information. I don't have any more business cards, but on the PowerPoint on the back, there is my information, contact information, as well as my team. Um, and then if you have any specific question that might relate to any of those people, feel free to reach out or you can contact me. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, PowerPoint in the back. Thank you.